So why did Patterson, New Jersey, become a center of locomotive machine tool production unprecedented anywhere in the 19th century outside of Philadelphia? How did Patterson and the northern New Jersey corridor actually develop into one of the most densely populated and productive areas in the entire planet? In 1791, America's first Treasury Secretary, Alexander Hamilton, established a society for the promotion of useful manufacturers. Hamilton had spotted the Great Falls at Totowa back in July of 1778 during the American Revolution, where he had joined General Washington and Lafayette at the falls while en route to their headquarters in Paramus. Later, Hamilton would remark, this was the finest site anywhere in the world for a manufactory. In his 1791 report on manufacturers, Hamilton references a society forming with a capital which is expected to be extended to at least half a million dollars, on behalf of which measures are already in train for prosecuting on a large scale the making and printing of cotton goods. While that report was issued, Hamilton's collaborators were already surveying the Great Falls area. Their idea? The construction of a city of a completely new type. An industrial city powered by raceways of water. This was no local plan or local project but rather involved some of the key personalities of America's Revolutionary War inner elite. People like General Philip Schuyler, Hamilton's father-in-law, Elias Boudinot, whose father had been a key collaborator of Benjamin Franklin and had been the first postmaster of Princeton, New Jersey. And it was their home at the Boudinot's where Alexander Hamilton was sent as a young man to be tutored in the ideas of the newly coming American Republic. Peter Colt. Colt was the liaison to the French officers during the revolution for General George Washington. Colt later became the first Treasury Secretary of the state of Connecticut after the revolution and was called in and served an absolutely critical role in the building of this new city. Pierre L'Enfant, the great city planner and builder, who of course was the designer of the nation's new capital, Washington, D.C. And Hamilton went so far as insisting that Patterson become a federal city like the District of Columbia. Abraham Godwin, Jr., this was the local patriotic family of the Patterson Totowa area. In 1775, Abraham Godwin Sr. had built the Passaic Hotel, which hotel became the center of Continental Army activity, trading, intelligence, etc. Abraham Jr., who would be a key collaborator with Hamilton in the founding of the Society for the Promotion of Useful Manufacturers, in fact, at that Passaic Hotel, would later, decades later, host the return of Marquis Lafayette to Patterson in 1824. The project, of course, came under heavy attack, as might be expected, especially by the financier oligarchical types like Gallatin and traitor Alan Burr, who of course murdered Hamilton in 1804. In fact, within a couple of years of the founding of the Society for the Promotion of Useful Manufacturers, the project merely completely collapsed. And by the 1800, the population of Patterson, once 500 strong, fell to just 45 people.
In the first part of the 19th century, the future of the American Republic hung in the balance with open calls for its dissolution and ultimately a renewed British military attack on the United States in the War of 1812. But a handful of patriots, led by the likes of Matthew Carey, as well as the architects of America's Military Academy at West Point, rallied to defend the nation. Likewise, despite these enemy operations, the profundity of Hamilton's Patterson project drove a handful of men to persist in the project even during its bleakest period. Thus, some of America's most talented, skilled artisans, inventors, and technology pioneers continued to arrive in Patterson. This combination of new arrivals working with the stalwart stay-behinds would in fact build Hamilton's model city and ultimately the northern New Jersey corridor. Key to this was Roswell L. Colt. Roswell was Peter Colt's younger son and having access to his father-in-law's wealth, this allowed Roswell and his older brother John to acquire full control of the virtually bankrupt Society for the Useful Manufacturers. And in 1814, Colt became the Society's governor, with brother John its deputy governor. Most notably, until 1895, every governor of the Society, with one exception, would be a member of the Colt family. Another key person was Thomas Rogers. Of later locomotive production fame, which would bear his name, Rogers was a skilled carpenter from Connecticut and had moved to Patterson shortly before the War of 1812. Rogers became quickly renowned for his machine-making skills, joining up with Abraham Godwin Jr to form the famous Godwin, Rogers, and Clark firm. The Clark in the firm was John Clark Sr., an immigrant from Scotland who had moved to Patterson from Rhode Island in 1795. In Patterson, Clark created a skilled workforce, including his son John Jr., that were capable of constructing domestically produced textile and other machinery. Among other things, the Clark's machining capability allowed the creation of the famous Henry Clay Mill, built in 1811, which produced material for the uniforms of America's soldiers in the War of 1812. Following the victory over the British Empire in the War of 1812, America's nation builders embarked on a project to turn the United States into a modern coal-based economic power. Central to the plan was the creation of an expanded and thoroughly self-sufficient American iron industry, fueled by Pennsylvania's abundant supply of hard anthracite coal, mined by companies associated with the Philadelphia nationalists Matthew Carey and Nicholas Biddle. With readily available iron, the nation could develop its own machine tools, railroad iron, and the domestic locomotive engine production capability required to expand the nation westward. To efficiently deliver such large amounts of Pennsylvania coal to northeast productive centers and ports, and to return manufactured products into the interior required an unprecedented construction of east-west transport and development corridors consisting of both canals and railroads. With the 1817 to 1835 construction of George Washington and Philip Schuyler's vision of an all-water route from the Hudson to the Great Lakes, the Erie Canal, patriots throughout the nation were inspired to agitate for similar grand projects. In the New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania corridor, these included the Cary Biddle organized Lehigh Valley Canal of Josiah White and New York Mayor Hone's Delaware and Hudson Canal across southern New York State. In New Jersey, 
American patriots agitated for an ambitious canal project, which if built, could deliver the Lehigh Coal and Navigation Company's anthracite to northern New Jersey and to New York. The epicenter of the corridor would be Patterson, Hamilton's designated first industrial city, which would serve as the productive hub of a refurbished northern New Jersey iron industry in existence since colonial times. In 1822, a pamphlet appeared throughout northern New Jersey spelling out a bold plan to build a Grand Canal from the Hudson to the Delaware River via Patterson, cutting through the iron-rich hills of northern New Jersey. The pamphlet, one of many to circulate throughout the area, was authored and released under the name Agrestus. Agrestus was Morristown's George P. McCulloch, and the canal was to be appropriately named the Morris Canal, named after early 18th century New Jersey Governor Lewis Morris, a key operative in the American colony's battle of that period against the so-called Venetian party of Britain's degenerate elite. McCulloch's pamphlet read in part, Suppose that by some miracle the channel of the Musconetcong were rendered boatable from the Delaware up to Stanhope, that a canal were dug from thence to meet Rockaway River at some point between Dover and the Valley Forge, that the channel were rendered passable from thence down to Patterson, the falls obviated by a chain of locks, and thus a water communication open between the Delaware and the Hudson to the center of Morris and Sussex counties. What would be the effect of this miracle? And for a certain distance along each bank of the canal, the facility with which coal, iron, ore, provisions could be transported in a country full of water powers would gradually introduce new forges, furnaces, and manufacturers of every sort. Patterson might thus become the Birmingham, as well as the Manchester, of America. As the Erie and Lehigh Valley canals near completion, Morristown, New Jersey's most prominent citizens, called a town meeting at Drake's Tavern in August of 1822 to plot out an organizing strategy for the grand project. Following the authorization of the Morris Canal Commission by the New Jersey legislature, Canal Commissioner McCulloch traveled to Albany in April of 1823 to personally confer with Governor DeWitt Clinton and his Erie Canal engineers. America's West Point nation-building elite considered the New Jersey Canal a Class I project, meriting the direct participation of the Ecole Polytechnique's General Simone Bernard and his assistant Colonel Totten. In October of 1823, Bernard produced his own report on the project stating that the object of the proposed canal was, quote, to open a communication between the great beds of coal on the Lehigh River and the ironworks of New Jersey, the manufacturers of Patterson and the city of New York. That same month, Governor DeWitt Clinton issued a comprehensive memorial addressed to McCulloch and the Morris Canal Commissioners. The canal will make New Jersey the greatest manufacturing county in America. The mountains near the root of the canal are inexhaustible masses of valuable iron ore. The anthracite or glance coal of Pennsylvania can be obtained by the canal to any extent and in the most economical manner. New Jersey will be thus enabled to manufacture iron in such quantities as to supersede the necessity of foreign importation. There are many flourishing institutions at Patterson and other places. As these establishments become more extended, the power of steam will be demanded. Coal will therefore be indispensable, as well as iron and steel, for the purpose of making and repairing the machinery of those important establishments. 
The whole line of the canal will exhibit manufacturing establishments and rising villages, boats crowded with the productions of nature and the fabrics of art, and the enterprising efforts of man improving the bounties of heaven. To adopt the sublime language of Holy Writ, the wilderness and the solitary place will become glad, and the desert will rejoice and blossom as the rose. In August 1824, America's leading European founding father, General Lafayette, returned to the United States to begin his year-long national tour, which would become vital to organizing and reorganizing America's patriotic nation-building networks. Shortly after landing in New York, Lafayette paid a special visit to the future Birmingham and Manchester of America, Patterson. The event held great significance for Patterson citizens, many of whom had now labored for more than a generation to realize Alexander Hamilton's vision of the town as America's first industrial city. After his procession had marched triumphantly into the town underneath an arch inscribed, Behold, our second father cometh, Lafayette made a special stop at Abraham Godwin's Passaic Hotel below the Great Falls to greet its owner, now affectionately known as the Old General. By now, Abraham Godwin Jr. was Patterson's leading town father and a veteran of America's two wars against the British Empire, as well as the political wars waged by America's enemies against the nation's early economic development. Lafayette's stop at the Passaic Hotel was a highly significant political gesture for it was there 32 years earlier where Hamilton, Godwin, and the Society for the Promotion of Useful Manufacturers had hammered out their plans to build America's model manufacturing city. During the festivities, Lafayette rose with a toast. To the recollections of Totowa, and the enjoyments of Patterson. May this happy, populous manufacturing town more and more bear witness to the superiority of Republican institutions and the blessings of freedom, equal rights, and self-government. Patterson had much to celebrate, for within a few months of Lafayette's visit, not only would John Quincy Adams be elected president, but his staunch supporter, New Jersey Governor Isaac Halstead Williamson, would remain in office through 1829. Thus, with American Nationals' leadership in both the state and federal executive levels, the process began to build this critical east-west canal and railroad infrastructure required to develop the revolutionary anthracite coal-fueled iron industry and a machine tool and locomotive engine production capability unparalleled in history. We have a Canadian border, we have a Mexican border, we have an Atlantic Ocean, we have a Pacific Ocean. These are our borders. This is our nation. We have to develop this territory for this nation in this territory. And our destiny implicitly with him, but for all of us is, our destiny is, is across the Pacific. As the Columbus crossed the Atlantic, 
we must cross the Pacific to liberate the people on the other side of the Pacific Ocean in the sense of engaging them as our partners against the European oligarchy. That was the policy. The March 4th, 1825 inauguration of President John Quincy Adams was the start of one of the most intense periods of economic progress in history. As Secretary of State under President Monroe, Adams had seen the establishment of the Board of Engineers for Fortifications headed by French engineer Simon Bernard, as well as the establishment of the Second National Bank of the United States, which had opened for business in Philadelphia in 1817. Canals and roads were pushed through, opening the West to settlement and funneling new mine coal to shops and cities and creating entirely new Midwestern centers of industry. The iron industry, now under tariff protection, was reborn after a century of imperial suppression. Railroads began military design construction and grew quickly from nothing to thousands of miles, all financed and carried out through a well-coordinated combination of federal, military, state, and local authorities. In 1825, the construction of the Morris Canal began and would enjoy special sponsorship by the Second Bank as a national priority, seeing the canal through to its completion in 1831. In Patterson, the raceway system envisioned by Hamilton underwent a major upgrade with the construction of the upper raceway in 1827, which drastically increased the volume and velocity of water for production along the lower raceway, allowing further expansion of the city's productive enterprises. The decades-long dream of an American railroad envisioned by America's leading technology pioneers like John Stevens could become a reality. Contrary to the British imperial use of railroads to extract raw materials from the interior to the coastlines solely for financial profit, Stevens had spelled out something completely different in an 1812 memorial written to the New York State Commission of Inland Navigation. The general adoption of the railways ought to become an object of primary attention to the national government. A general system of internal communication and conveyance should be adopted, and the necessary surveys made to embrace and unite every section. It might then indeed be truly said that these states would constitute one family, intimately connected and held together in indissoluble bonds of union. In 1828, South Carolina Railroad Chief Engineer Horatio Allen was dispatched to England by New York City Mayor Hone's Delaware and Hudson Canal Company to arrange the purchase of four Stevenson-built locomotives for use on America's early railroads. In 1830, Allen visited Patterson in search of the facilities and a skilled workforce that would be able to build locomotives and other requisite railroad equipment, and in Patterson, he found them. Godwin, Rogers and Company delivered 100 sets of wheels and axles for Allen South Carolina Railroad. That same year, the Society for Promotion of Useful Manufacturers President, Roswell Cole, had commissioned engineer John Langdon Sullivan to conduct a survey for a railroad which would parallel the Morris Canal, but which would continue on over the Delaware River to Pittston, Pennsylvania, on the Susquehanna River into the coal regions of eastern Pennsylvania. In January 1829, a petition appeared before the New Jersey legislature presented by a Mr. Godwin of Patterson for a bill 
to incorporate a Patterson and Hudson Railroad Company. After two years of intensive lobbying and political agitation by Godwin and his friends, the bill finally passed the legislature on January 21st, 1831, creating the Patterson and Hudson River Railroad Company. On July 4th, 1831, seven years after Lafayette's triumphant return to the United States and with the Morris Canal now open, the town of Patterson would enjoy another celebration, again presided over by the old general, Abraham Godwin Jr., this time commemorating the 45th anniversary of America's independence with a groundbreaking ceremony initiating the construction of the Patterson and Hudson River Railroad. During the celebrations, P&H President Villamon Dickerson spelled out the strategic significance of the project's intent. The easy and rapid communication between different parts of Union must have a powerful effect and bind more firmly together those parts which will make that Union perpetual. The work we are now about to commence assumes a consequence far beyond the mere accommodation of the town of Patterson or even the state of New Jersey. Who can resist the conclusion that the Patterson and Hudson River Railroad is but the first link of that great chain which is to bind the western part of the state of New York to its capital? And who will charge me with extravagance if I extend that chain in imagination yet thousands of miles west, even to the extreme limits of our territory? In 1832, Thomas Rogers formed the famous Rogers, Ketchum, and Grosvenor, which produced the iron for the Patterson and Hudson drawbridges over the Hackensack and Passaic rivers. Not accidentally, the P&H's Allen purchased McNeil locomotive ended up into the capable hands of master machinist Thomas Rogers. It took 18 months for Rogers to tear down and reconstruct the Stevenson-built McNeil from whence he designed and produced the machine tools and facilities required to produce Patterson's first locomotive engine, the Sandusky, in 1837. It's important to note that such a feat and the subsequent mass production of locomotives would have been entirely impossible without the density of machine tool capability, readily available iron, and the highly skilled labor force which was now Patterson, New Jersey. By the 1850s, the output of locomotives from the three Patterson-based plants, Rogers, Danforth and & Cook, and Grant Company, was rivaled only by the famous Baldwin Works in Philadelphia. In 1854, Danforth & Cook produced the first anthracite-fueled engine, and by the time of the Civil War, 75% of all locomotive engines were being built between Patterson and Philadelphia. The famous Union Pacific Engine No. 119, the Golden Spike locomotive that completed the Transcontinental Railroad, was a product of Patterson's Rogers Locomotive Works. And ironically, both engines, the General and Texas, which opposed each other in the Great Railroad Chase during the Civil War, were produced in Patterson. The productive power of the Manchester and Birmingham of America didn't end with the railroads. Because of its density of productive labor power, Patterson became the center of industrial pioneers in textiles, machinery, and aircraft production. Although known today in many popular history books as the Silk City, the labor-intensive silk industry's arrival to Patterson actually represented a regression from Hamilton's conception of America's first industrial city and its high standards of a dignified labor force. A far cry from the child and immigrant slave labor conditions which became notorious, leading ultimately to the great Patterson silk strike of 1913.
Unfortunately, most of New Jersey's citizens have little or no idea of where they actually live or how one of the most densely populated and productive land areas on the planet had come into being. In fact, if you live anywhere in the United States, especially in the interior, you can ask yourself, where am I? Why is this town or city here? What is the history? What type of development corridor created it? And where is it now? If you ask these questions, the answers you find may be surprising and unnerving. For where there is no vision, the people shall perish.